Listo. Listo. Perfecto. Hola, muy buenos días a todas, a todos y todas. Muchísimas gracias por acompañarnos a nuestro seminario de la Facultad de Ciencias Naturales. Eh, para mí es un placer presentarles a Diana González Ramírez. Me voy a pasar inmediatamente a inglés porque su presentación es en inglés y su perfil está en inglés y la ciencia se hace en inglés. Entonces, eh, it's my great pleasure to introduce you um, Diana González Ramírez. Diana conducted her undergraduate degree in Pontificia Universidad Javeriana here in Bogotá. And she worked with mice from Mesoamerica and looking at the cryptic diversity of the singing mice, eh, exponinomis. Um, then she moved to the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, where she completed her master's degree in evolution ecology and systematics with a broader interest in conservation genetics and genomics. Uh, and now she's a PhD student at the uh, Leibniz Institute of Analysis of Biodiversity Change in Bonn in Switzerland and she's specializing in evolutionary genomics and population genetics. Her current research focuses on population genetics and short-term evolution of the songbird germline district chromosome. But today, um, from her title, she's probably going to uh, show us another type of another part of her research. Um, so uh, thank you, Diana, for um, agreeing to talk to us today. And I just want to remind everyone to um, um, keep their microphones off and your cameras off, and we're going to leave the questions uh, all the way to the end. So thank you, Diana, and take it away. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergio and Veronica, for inviting me today. Uh, I'm really, really happy to be able to, to show what I have learned and my work in, to Colombian people. And uh, so as Sergio already uh, said it, I will just also go uh, really fast. Uh, so I, I did my bachelor's in the Pontificia Universidad Javeriana where I got really interested in, in DNA and genetics. Then I went to the uh, LMU in, the, in Munich and I discovered also my passion for population genetics and evolutionary biology. And I improved my uh, lab skills, but also I realized that a lot of this, uh, when you're researching in this kind of field, you do a lot of bioinformatics. And luckily I, I also like, I enjoyed doing it. And now I'm just starting like also my journey as a PhD student in the, uh, Leibniz Institute of Biodiversity of uh, Analysis Change. And uh, uh, now um, I will focus on what the work that I did in during my master's at the LMU. So I, I will present you mainly what I did for my master's, which, uh, and that I titled like Unveiling the Paradox. Uh, revealing divergences between behavioral traits and evolutionary histories in corticus species of the Alps. So um, the divergence of populations can be due to adaptation and selection, such as sexual selection, and give rise to reproductive isolation that resulting ultimately in speciation. Hybridization occurs when uh, individuals from distinguishable taxa, such as species, populations, or groups of populations, they interbreed. And this can lead to organisms showing up intermediate phenotypes. Um, hybridization can give rise also to dohansky muller incompatibilities or negative epistasis, which is a, refers to a genetic interactions between alleles and multiple genetic locations. And these alleles can have detrimental effects on fitness when they come together in hybrids. A, another potential outcome a, is when in the cases that 
the fitness of the hybrids are as good as their parentals, uh, we can see that uh, introgression begins. And introgression is defined, uh, it refers to the process of incorporating genetic material from one taxon into the gene pool of another. And this can occur when reproductive, reproductive barriers are weak. Uh, adaptive integration, hybrid speciation, or even reversing speciation uh, become possible when hybrids are positively selected because they are uh, vigorous or yeah, they are better in their environment and they do not back cross uh, with the parental uh, species or populations. And uh, with their high genetic variance, they can even explore and reach uh, new adaptive peaks. So uh, hybridization and integration results in, can result in intermediate uh, phenotypes. However, they can uh, arise through other evolutionary processes, such as the novel mutations, that when they are subjective to positive selection, they are advantages. Another way is when uh, new environmental pressures act on the standing genetic variation, uh, favoring pre-existing genetic variants that promote adaptation. Another process is phenotypic plasticity, uh, where the organism has the ability to exhibit like different phenotypes and adapt to environmental changes, but without modifying its genetics. Um, so hybridization and integration can lead to discordances uh, between reproductive traits and the evolutionary history of the species. Reproductive traits are uh, shaped by evolutionary processes and uh, are expected like to reflect the species evolutionary history that is often uh, inferred based on phylogenetic relationships among like the species. And to know how these traits have evolved and if they are under selection, we actually need uh, like a background tree based on neutral markers such as SNPs, for instance, and compare it to uh, the tree based on, on the genotypes that they underline the, the traits. But sometimes this difference can not be exactly the same or like congruent. This, uh, so this can lead to have uh, same or similar uh, genotypes in different parts uh, of the background phylogenetic tree. This kind of like a four, uh, there are like several like possible explanations why this happens. Uh, for instance, ecological specialization, uh, where um, unique traits uh, that uh, adapted to a specific niche that may not align with a broader evolutionary history. Um, yes, then another possible uh, explanation can be convergent evolution. Uh, so here, uh, similar traits have evolved independently in different taxa because they face uh, just similar ecological challenges. This can also happen from the novel mutations um, or even like selection on of ancestral alleles. So for instance, uh, in Elicolius uh, butterflies, uh, including species of uh, Eliconius melpomene and Eliconius uh, sydno, uh, display like a discord discordance between like their uh, genealogy and wing color patterns. Um, so the color partners actually play a crucial role in the mate 
in the selection of their mate and their reproductive behaviors. So the genes that are underlying the color are actually under selection. And uh, in certain male pomene populations, uh, females uh, prefer males whose wings pattern actually mimic uh, those that are uh, this species that is actually uh, um, is not related and is actually toxic. It's not, it's okay. Yes, it's uh, not tasty at all which is Heliconius eratum. So instead of having the similar uh, wing color as the closely related species uh, within the same genus, there is a convergent evolution of the color pattern and discordance with the species evolutionary history. And now we focus more in grasshoppers. So a uh, cortipus grasshoppers species is a uh, fast radiation. This means that a uh, cortipus underwent rapid diversification and holds many species that are closely related, around 230. And uh, this was like resulting in incomplete lineage sorting and gene flow is relatively common. So they seem to differ primarily in reproductive behavior, which, well, well, as you can see, they're all quite morphologically similar, but when you look at the reproductive behavior, and in this case is the male song, uh, it looks similar. They use the male song to attract uh, females, and the male song is actually species specific of each, uh, yes, of each species. Um, and multiple of these species are actually, they coexist sympatrically and they occupy similar ecological niches. And that is why we also recognize this uh, genus as a non-ecological radiation that is actually driven mainly by sexual selection. So the male songs. Um, well, Nevertheless, uh, it is hard to understand the role of selection and the consequences of hybridization in this, uh, in this radiation. Um, so taxonomies, uh, like most of the research, really relied on the male song and morphological characteristics for their taxonomy, classification, and also the nomenclature. However, there's like one study that infer actually the phylogenetic tree in Cortipus, but at the European scale. And here we just see that each song has the same uh, most recent common ancestor, meaning that the song evolved once in European scale. Um, but they are not... Uh, really too many uh, studies that include the genetics in the mom. Uh, on top of that, grasshoppers also possess a really, really large genome around 13.6 uh, gigabases, which makes it uh, difficult to assemble a reference genome due to, well, its complexity. And also it has a really high proportion of repetitive DNA. A, um, a lot of uh, transposons and um, a, yes, repetitive elements. However, as, as studies usually, I think they focus more in small genomes size. So because they're well easier to sequence, but there are many other species with large genomes, for instance, the a, a holote, a, that are relevant for understanding some selected processes. So uh, now going, zooming in a little bit more, uh, the Cortipus uh, grasshoppers of the Bigupulus group have uh, colonized and expanded across Europe, including alpine habitats, following the deglaciation or like the, the retreat of the ice. And uh, actually we have Cortipus uh, bruneus, Cortipus bruneus, eh, Cortipus bigutulus, Cortipus mollis mollis, and Cortipus mollis ignifer that coexist all together in the Alps. 
And here, uh, Cortipus uh, mollis mollis and Cortipus bigutulos are more in the north part of the Alps, this part, and Ignifer and Bruneos more in the south part of the Alps. Um, moreover, there have been some studies that they have uh, in the laboratory that they have did some hybridization in the males and they have obtained some intermediate songs, but they are actually behavioral sterile because their songs don't attract the females. Uh, and they have uh, also found some kind of a, like a mixture in in lower altitudes, for instance, in Medellin. But uh, yes, there are just indices. However, one really interesting uh, thing that the uh, English found uh, a time ago already is a population, like a, a variation and an aberrant form of Cortipus bruneus songs and morphology, uh, which is called Cortipus bruneus ticina. I, this one has been observed in higher altitudes, and uh, the song of the scene is actually an intermediate phenotype between Bigutulus and Bruneus. So this uh, song implies a potential hybridization event that uh, between these two species, but uh, this hypothesis has not yet been investigated, and uh, we in this uh, research we investigated. Um, so I aim for to answer three main questions. Uh, first of all, how can population genetic studies be effectively conducted in species with large genomes, such as Cortipus, uh, given the challenges posed by their uh, complex genome? Uh, the second question will be, does the male song that it is used for taxonomical classification in Cortipus follow the evolutionary history of the variation? Could the emergence of the intermediate uh, phenotype uh, in Bruneos Ticino be attributed to processes such as hybridization or integration? So, First of all, I'm gonna talk really fast about a little bit about uh, the sampling, for example, uh, for species in the Alps, uh, but uh, five uh, five populations. Um, we also sample a uh, Ticino Bruneos that is in higher altitudes, and all the species identification were based in male song. Um, we also included some pure samples, reference pure samples that were not located in, in the high altitudes of uh, Alps, but in other, for instance, in from Germany or from Poland, having a total around 200 uh, samples. Uh, we extracted their DNA and we employed the dvrad sec protocol. Uh, this technique is specialized also for uh, when the genomes, for instance, is really large and uh, we need uh, we don't have a reference genome. Uh, then we perform the novo assembly uh, as we don't have the reference genome. And um, we obtain, it's a way to obtain a reduced uh, representation of the genome. So then what is the best strategy actually to filter the large genomes? Um, yeah, so it is uh, it is important to apply filters to remove uh, individuals and loci with low quality sequences. So here, really fast, I apply a four step uh, filtering, and um, the scheme consisted of excluding sites and individuals, considering the amount of missing data. Uh, then I follow with features to remove loss, lossy uh, with low confidence SNP calls, and this was done with the VCF tools. So uh, actually what I want to take out from here is that uh, even though many, many SNPs were filtered, as you can see, practically 
99% of them. We have at the end a data set with very low missing data. And the raw data, so we, and we actually retain almost all the individuals. So after doing the featuring, uh, we did uh, several analyses. Um, to observe the greatest genetic differences among these five taxa, I run a, a principal component analysis using the software ENU, which is uh, also specialized for a data set that have a lot of missing data. So the results of the PCA show that the five taxa uh, corresponds actually to four um, genetic clusters. So PCA, PC1 uh, separate the subspecies mollis mollis from the other, other four, and uh, including it's like the same mollis ignifer, which are in the same species. And PC2 uh, differentiate bigutulus uh, from ignifer and from bruneus. And moreover, the potential hybrid Piscino bruneus is actually closer and overlaps with Portipus bruneus, and they form just a single cluster. Yeah. Then uh, we look also what, how is the mixture between these individuals. For that, um, we infer it with the super fine rat structure, which is designed also for this kind of data of rat sec data. And uh, so in the next figures, they, here in the, the individuals are organized by species in these two axes. And uh, the color depends actually on the degree of the co-ancestry. So yes, um, first I will explain a little bit the figure so you can understand later. Um, the bluish colors represent related individuals and the yellowish color is unrelated. Uh, in case of admixture uh, or gene flow, we could expect to see something like this, uh, this, like this. Um, so instead of these uh, squares with higher levels of ancestry. Now, these are the results that I obtained. And we can recognize the same uh, four clusters as the PCA, having Piscino, Bruneos, uh, included in Bruneos. So they are grouped together and they have relatively low co-ancestry. Also, and there's no really clear gene flow between the taxa. Uh, then, uh, to answer, like I infer a phylogenetic uh, relationship between the five relevant cortipus uh, taxa. The tree was produced um, with a software called, like with Tetra, which accounts for incomplete lineage sorted, as uh, we have it in cortipus, and also with a, a lot uh, amount of missing data, uh, using a non parametric bootstrap to 1000. So then when we look at, at uh, these hundreds of loci altogether, we see a big cloud where we differentiate the main clusters, but the relationship is not easy to distinguish. So there's a, it could be a lot of discordance between the loci, which is expected with this kind of radiations um, in cortibus, but also because of the possibility of gene flow. But then, nevertheless, we apply the coalescent uh, method and it allows us to infer the relationships. So for simplicity, I will pass to this <laughs> simple uh, tree to understand better. And then we expect actually that Molly's subspecies to be sister taxa grouped together in a monophyletic plate. However, in the Alps in the macro scale of the Alps, Song of Molly subspecies does not share uh, the most recent common ancestor. And we can see these two independent clades with the same Molly song. 
Another important result is that the Ticino Bruneos and Portipos Bruneos were grouped together in the same monophyletic clade. Um, some of these species um, are believed, like as Ticino, that have intermediate phenotypes. So uh, probably arising from several evolutionary processes. Um, but well, I want to uh, now discuss, as I insisted before, like how to handle uh, large genomes. So conducting population genetic studies on species with large genomes and obtaining a, like a reliable representation of their genomes it has several challenges to the, due to the complexity of the uh, and the proportion, the high proportion of repetitive elements. So that is why it's important to choose and apply carefully uh, the methods and bioinformatic analysis. So first of all, the ddrad sec protocol has been a successful applying complex genomes. However, this would actually lead to a lossy with high, very high coverage due to the, for instance, transposable elements that the ones they are amplified, they all like gather together in a, in a lossy. So you have a very high coverage, but uh, this can be uh, also like with stringent filtering, with, uh, filtering you can actually uh, take them out and deal with them. Um, also, this can be uh, also another thing of the large genomes is that the considerable amounts of missing data you will obtain and also can be uh, addressed by a stringent filtering criteria. So I just also wanted to, to remind that even though the missing data passed from 94% to 18%, um, we can, there's a lot of, uh, we also conserve some individuals during the featuring and uh, we can actually work very well with this kind of missing data, percentage of missing data. Um, so moreover, it is important to use analytical methods that accommodate large amounts of missing data and for our case, also accommodates a incomplete lineage sortings because Cortipus is a recent variation. For instance, a orchid species, a Cypripedium calciolus, which holds a genome size of 31.6 gigabase pairs, was successfully sequenced uh, and genotyped using DDRATSEC. And who and the author, uh, Gargulio, also adapted filtering strategies and obtaining a data set of 25 missing data and retaining 2.5% of loci. However, nowadays there are like novel methodologies and software designed effectively uh, to accommodate this uh, missing uh, genetic data and this kind of uh, problems that can occur with large genomes. Now, <laughs> uh, regarding the Cortipus taxa, the two uh, Cortipus, Cortipus molly species are taxonomically classi classifying the single species due to their high, they are really, really similar in their song. However, in all our analysis, we observe genetic distinctiveness between them. Corticus uh, mollis mollis emerges, emerges as the most distinct uh, cluster in the analysis and uh, being separated from mollis juniper. So these two subspecies, they actually don't share the most recent common sensor, as we saw. And the discordance suggests that they are, there must be a selection on these traits and points to limited uh, gene flow uh, with uh, mollis mollis. 
uh, possibly due to multiple reproductive barriers, um, in addition already to the behavioral isolation. <clears throat> so this divergence could be driven by various evolutionary processes. So it is likely that like one explanation could be that mollis ignifer has a distinct origin from mollis mollis and this is suggested by the similarity in the song with a uh, cortipus lesinesis which is found mainly in croatia and uh, northern italy and it is possible that when mollis ignifer dispersed uh, to the south of the Alps uh, several million years ago, it might have come into contact with uh, Mollis Mollis, creating uh, an opportunity for a hybridization or gene flow between Mollis Signifer and Mollis Mollis, and leading to the possibility of introgression. Uh, introgression, uh, where some genes may be responsible for the male song or the female preference uh, of Mollis Mollis, where incorporated into the Molly for gene pool. Another possible explanation is that uh, in ancestral, an ancestral allele or trait of the song uh, is retained in, cor in Cortipus mollis mollis and uh, Cortipus mollis ignifer, but maybe was lost in Cortipus bruneus and bigotulus species. However, um, the discordance also is another possible explanation. Um, could be convergent evolution in songs, either from the novel mutation or from standing genetic variation. So it is possible that both lineages actually evolve independently a similar song, like analogous song, as they adapted to similar challenging environment, environments as it is the Alps. So they came up with similar solutions. So for example, a closely related species of uh, anol, anol uh, lizards independently evolved similar courtship traits, like uh, they display behavior, but also the this kind of throat fan, <laughs> uh, the coloration of it. Uh, there are traits that actually have uh, evolved multiple times in the genomes. And this demonstrates actually that sexual selection can uh, be really like have a powerful influence and it can driven even independent evolution in similar uh, traits and even in the same genus. Um, so, uh, in our study, well, uh, we have five different uh, corticos taxa inhabiting the Alps, and we have identified just four genetic clusters instead of five uh, that we were expecting. So, uh, the reason of that is because the Sino Bruneos, uh, the variant form, uh, that was collected in high altitude location was uh, um, clustered together with Cortipus bruneus and doesn't really have a co-ancestry or uh, it doesn't show signs of high uh, hybridization between the potential what we thought they were the parental populations. Um, so we see that between them there's no genetic differentiation and yes, no, not really ongoing gene flow. So there's no really a, a barrier between them. Um, now, what are the possible uh, explanations of this? So the lack of uh, uh, genetic differentiation also may suggest uh, that song uh, differences arose least recently and do not manifest genetically. It is possible that Cortipus ticino represent a, a Bruneos isolated in higher, in higher altitude, 
that in response to these uh, extreme environmental pressures and geographical isolation, like in the periphery, because they have like, so uh, this in is high altitudes and cortical is just a little bit below. So it's like they could actually, uh, there maybe there is peripatric divergence being driven maybe by the novel mutations or even by at least from uh, the standing genetic pool and that, that in these conditions will turn out to be advantages and resulted in these phenotypic changes that they are similar to be good that is why we thought it was intermediate like hybrid between these two However, another explanation could be actually phenotypic plasticity. It might explain this difference. Um, adaptive plasticity offers like a rapid and flexible, um, like adaptive response to like a short term um, and can be actually achieved through transcriptional processes that uh, uh, are regulated by gene expression. And actually, all of these mechanisms are not uh, mutually ex exclusive. They can actually implement each other. So uh, conducting population genetic studies on species with large genomes, such as corticals, uh, presents considerable challenges. Notably, the high amount of missing data that uh, we were able to handle uh, through data filtering and selecting special analytic methods that they deal with this kind of uh, large genomes. And yeah. Uh, also, we saw that the male song does. Uh, which is uh, the taxonomic classification is based on, on the male song. This does not align with the evolutionary history of corticus. The discordances uh, suggest that there must be selection on these traits. And um, this can be explained by adaptive integration or a convergent, convergent evolution. Um, yeah. Uh, also, there is no evidence of hybrid population on the higher altitude uh, locations in the Alps, as hypothesized for Ticino Bruneos. And some potential, some potential explanation are the apparition of uh, novel mutations leading to peripatric divergence or phenotypic plasticity. So for future research in the context of studying the evolution of song, it is essential to include the like other individuals like representatives from several subspecies. So this uh, research, the findings of this research demonstrate that different subspecies may not necessarily share the same most recent common ancestry. Uh, so, moreover, some hypotheses have emerged uh, from this research. Um, when we observe the evolution of the of the genotype in different independent clades, se several factors uh, that I mentioned before uh, that they could be in play, and including, for instance. Uh, uh, adaptive integration and convergent evolution, and um, or the emergence also of uh, novel mutations. So future studies, yeah. <laughs> so future studies uh, should actually investigate these possibilities. Additionally, there is a need for a. Uh, detail like revision of the taxonomical classification and nomenclature within cortibus uh, with an incorporation of genetic information. However, it will be informative also to explore other traits associated with the song, since the song is actually produced by the 
uh, stridulation, like movement uh, of the leg against the wing. So probably conducting morphometric analysis it can provide uh, additional insights that can be compared to our findings. And um, actually, just like a teaser, uh, in this moment, there is a, a colleague of mine that is doing some specialized morphometric analysis. Uh, and we're starting to see that actually, like looking more at the shape of the shape and uh, wide, how wide is, and the stridulation of the wing. And we can, we have, we are seeing that actually this is correlated with the songs. So uh, it follows the same pattern uh, for the songs. So it's actually different from what I have presented uh, regarding the genetic part. And these are like my main uh, references. And I wanted to say thank you to my research group in hybridization and speciation group at the LMU. Uh, to my supervisor, Ricardo Pereira, and the PhD student in the moment that was really guiding me and helping me through throughout this process. And this was when I presented my master's thesis a uh, time ago. Uh, I hope you enjoyed my presentation, and please let me know if you have any other questions. Diana, thank you very much. That was really, really interesting to see how this uh, complex genetic tools can maybe not help us with the taxonomy <laughs> and and also correlate that with uh, behavioral traits. I have two questions. One question is not directly related to the research you just showed us. My question is, when you're talking to, say, your mother, your grandmother, uh, your your sister, your brother, how do you explain this really complicated um, question between the evolutionary history and, um, and 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 the genomics and the traits and how do how do you do this? Like, what 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 do you resort to? How do you talk to them? What analogies or metaphors do you use to explain complex uh, concepts or methods like this to people that are not in science? Okay, <laughs> that's actually a really interesting question. Um, mm, well, good thing I would say that the, at least in biology you can actually show the <laughs> the organism. Like grandma, I'm studying this. I can tell you what is happening. You can actually, uh, for instance, in the morphological part, you can say like, look. They all look similar, right? And they are uh, actually in the Alps, which is a really um, challenging environment. That and you can they can actually that also relate to themselves in experiences, probably. So uh, you can actually you sometimes what I do is do comparisons to the humans. Uh, for instance, as we well. Colombian people, we are certain level, we have certain like, okay, we're shorter, for instance, that uh, people in Europe that maybe are taller. So they're actually also the, the tone of the skin. We have certain adaptations to our environment that they can actually see. And then of course, maybe the difficult part is the genetic part. And then I said, like, okay, we, uh, you know, everybody has uh, their DNA, and there are some changes that actually there are not all the changes that are shown. There, are, then they started actually modifying these pieces of DNA uh, that are inside us, and sometimes you don't see it uh, externally. And uh, so I, that is why I try to do to compare, and so they can maybe relate to something and. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so just related to something that they might know and then they're or used to yeah. to create some sort of a analogy between the grasshoppers and um and humans. Okay. Thank you. My 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 second question is um it's really intriguing that this um 
hybrid, the Ticino, not hybrid anymore, uh, has such a different song. And I was wondering if you talk a little bit about their life cycle. I mean, meaning these high altitude populations, are they singing at the same time as the low altitude populations? I mean, I guess that resources might be showing up in a different time of the year because in the high elevation. So maybe the life cycles are not any more um, intertwined, like the lower population um, Bruneos is singing at a different time of the year. So basically there is no reason why they would be, um, I mean, they're not conflicting on the same channels of communications because it's, it's happening at different times of the year. So I, I don't know if you can talk a little bit about their life cycles and if it's the same, if they're reproducing at the same time or not. Um, yes, well, I'm not uh, an expert on that, but as long as like, I understand that actually they are really similar. There's no uh, studies actually studying that. In Ticino, uh, they, it was just recognized by their song and it would be actually interesting to see if their life cycle is uh, a bit different. It can be, as you said, it could be switched because they are having high uh, altitudes, mm -hmm. but there's uh, in the moment like no evidence of that. And actually all the corticus uh, genus, corticus, yes, species, they are really, really similar ecologically. So uh, they inhabit also like similar niches so this this you know has a this niche that is the higher altitude that has other challenges mm -hmm. uh but uh we have not seen really something well it has not been studied so i'm not gonna yes even okay. but it will be interesting to see but they are really similar ecologically right yeah okay yeah because basically if there are some other differences not only in the extreme environments as you mentioned but also they are not overlapping in their time of reproduction, then, I mean, then that, that could easily explain why they are singing so differently, even though they are clustered genetically. Yes, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, I do think that maybe arriving to that level, maybe you will start to see some genetic differentiation because that will affect directly probably the sexual. Uh, right selection also yeah exactly camilo has his hand raised camilo can you turn on your microphone Please, and maybe for the presentation uh, i'm wondering if uh, do you have some data of reproductive isolation based in the in the songs of these two species of the altitude and high that have difference in altitude or not is some reproductive isolation associated with the songs or not in this case uh, uh, there are okay. There have been no studies about actually reproductive isolation of this Ticino. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as we see, they are also clustering in the same, uh, a, yes, a genetic group. So, and uh, that uh, in this moment, actually, there is one uh, student looking at if they can actually hybridize in the laboratory. So okay. to see how strong is the reproductive isolation between Ticino, Bruneos, Ticina, and just Bruneos. Uh, yes, unfortunately, there's not much uh, research yet about that. So there are many open questions, interesting ones. <laughs> and the other Thank one you. is, uh, you use this data set to try to test for, specifically for gene flow with some specific tests? Um, so no, not specifically, but like, for instance, it would be really nice to look at demographic analysis and to see if maybe there's a, yeah, I think that's like also the next step. There's this analysis show, uh, that maybe there's no gene flow. Like it seems like no, but this analysis usually are used also to see, uh, maybe there is maybe. So I think the next step is also will be like to do some, uh, yeah, demographic analysis or maybe there could be integration in the past, which would be really interesting to, to see. 
Por medio And de repeats. statistics, Alabama tests, so this kind of test perceives you have to include. Because you Yes. have incompleteness sorting, so maybe the cause of incompleteness sorting could be this inflow. Yes, I, I also <laughs> do think uh, it could be. Uh, and um, because, that, yes, it's a recent variation, so you actually expect to see more uh, gene flow. Uh, but yeah, I cannot <laughs> also tell you so much. I would like, um, would like to do it also in the future and see, yes, even if it's maybe integrate like gene flow from both sides or mostly from one side. Um, also depending on which uh, part are from the Alps, if we're in the north or in the south, uh, because actually in the Alps there's like a ridge that acts as a barrier. It could act as a barrier. So, but it has also like maybe during glaciation it was a strong barrier. Nowadays maybe not so much. So it would be also too interesting to see the gene flow in the past and recent one Okay, also. thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Camilo. Uh, Paola, you have your hand raised. Sí. Yeah, uh, thank you, Diana. It was very good. Uh, I really liked your presentation. I was going to ask you something related to what you just said about the integration in the past, <laughs> because I was very interested to know if you have uh, been, you have tested uh, that or are planning to test. Or, and also, I was going to ask you about um, if you have any inference on how the biogeographic history on that region has shaped your results, for instance. You talked a, lot about, a, a little bit about barriers at some point in your last intervention, but uh, what can you say about this? I don't know much about the region either, so I would love to hear more about it. Okay, okay. Well, uh, for the moment, let's say that we have talked in the group about hypotheses of what could happen in the past. So uh, I think that uh, when there was glaciation, probably they are like in lower altitude, maybe some refugia pockets. So for instance, I, I thought that maybe uh, Ticino would also actually be ancestral, like have been in these refugia pockets. And once the glaciation went uh, away, like the glaciation and then they can actually expand to higher altitudes. So, well, this Ticino was maybe now already specialized in uh, extreme environments and maybe expanded, but went uh, always to these higher altitudes. And it could be that then what we call uh, Cortipus um, Bruneos uh, went to lower altitudes and uh, like, stay a little bit lower altitude, specialize and a little bit in lower altitudes. That could have happened. Now regarding, for instance, uh, Molly's Molly's and Molly's Signifer, I think also with the retreat of the ice, like, so if the ice is there, it's, we will think that it's a, a isolation barrier. And uh, once the, uh, the glaciation is over, so it melts, it can actually lead to maybe some path or some opportunities of hybridization and even integration of, because uh, maybe it's easier if I also show the map. Probably, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, okay, maybe this one. So uh, um, uh, for Molly's uh, Ignifer and Molly's Molly's, we thought, uh, well, there could be also many options that uh, Molly's, so Molly's, Igni, Molly's Molly's is more like in the nar north part of the Alps and Ignifer come, could come from the south uh, because we saw that there uh, there's another corticus uh, here that is the song is really similar to Molly Signifer. And um, so during the glaciation, probably it was in Italy, in Croatia, and then after the ice melt, it could expand and conquer some sites in, in the Alps. 
and it could even like maybe have contact with Molly's Molly's. And here's when I, uh, even the past um, recently, that is what it would be really nice to study and would like to study. It could be some uh, hybridization integration between them. And no. I'm not so I'm not so sure if you have mentioned it or did you mention it in your presentation? But did you say about the time of divergence of these groups? Um, I think I didn't mention it. Oh, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. I think this was the because I didn't I didn't look at it during my analysis, and this was the. Uh, Maybe in this, uh, I don't remember, but I think in this paper, uh, Nolan and collaborators, uh, I think they look at the time of divergence of these ones. Sounds good. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Diana. Thank you very much for your presentation. Really interesting topic. Thank you, Camilo and Paola, for your questions. Um, so thank you, everyone, for attending our seminar. Thank you, Diana. I know it's probably already at the end of your Thursday. So thank you for staying tuned and waiting all day for to talk to us. Um, just to remind everyone, in two weeks' time, we have a very interesting talk by Marion uh, Bazooks. Uh, she is a postdoc here in Colombia, but she's from France. And the title of her presentation, which will be in Spanish, is Respuesta de los Árboles Tropicales a los Climas Futuros, con un enfoque if fisiológico Entonces, para todos aquellos interesados en evolución, en carbono, en ecofisiología, entonces los esperamos dentro de 15 días. Eh, Diana, muchísimas gracias y bueno, feliz jueves y feliz viernes para todos. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Chao. Chao, gracias. Verónica.